If you would take your Bibles and uh, turn to 1 John chapter 4 while you're turning there, um, let me send you greetings from our pastor who's on vacation this week. And he wanted you to know that he misses every one of you and is really looking forward to coming back next week. Um, he's very excited about the 40 days of prayer. Our church will be starting next week and also with the new start time for the contemporary service so that Dr. Yunt will be able to preach live at 9 o'clock, 10.30 in here, and then 11 o'clock over in the Christian Life Center. That service will start at 11 there. And uh, by the way, they can hear you right now. Would you welcome the Christian Life Center as they join us right now? We welcome you all. A few of you are cheering. That's great. Well, if you would, take your Bibles and let's stand together, 1 John chapter 4. And I want to read beginning in verse 18. Let's listen together as we hear what God's Word has to say to us today. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because He first loved us. So if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we look into your word this morning, we come together with gratitude to thank you so much for revealing your word to us and helping us know how to live and how to be saved and experience abundant life, not only here but forevermore, and we thank you. Now, Father, we realize today that we need the presence of your Holy Spirit to break open the bread of life for us this morning so that we may, be, we may eat and be strengthened and grow more and more together in the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work to open our eyes, that we might see the wonderful things in your law. And for those who are at areas where you are challenging them to grow by faith, that you would have your way in their lives this morning. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. About 19 years ago, Dina and I learned that we were expecting our second child. As Rachel's birth crept closer and closer, I realized that there was a tug of war between two emotions going on in my heart. On the one hand, I had this strong emotion of joy expecting the day that she would be born that month of December. But on the other hand, fear was trying to hold me back from getting to that date. You see, I was growing increasingly fearful that I would have to take the love I had for my son Joshua and divide it in half so that she would only get half of my love for him and he would only get half of love for that time forward. Well, I'm happy to tell you that all those fears were swept away in the delivery room with her first cry. As soon as little Rachel was born into my life, a great love was born into my heart. Her little cry was like music in my ears, and she's been singing to me ever since. That little life came with a great love that simply swept all those fears away. Do you know what the most um, popular command in the Bible is? The one you hear more than any other command in the Bible is, do not fear. Do you know what the greatest command in the Bible is? Love God and love others. In this passage that we're going to look at today, John's, John will tell us that God's perfect love literally sweeps fear out the door. This morning, I want to show you how that works. The first thing you need to see, you're going to find in verses 7 through 10, it is the power of God's love. So let's consider for a few minutes the power of God's love. God's perfect love is a love like no other. Now, listen, there is a common love that is common to all people in all places at all times. 
Because all people are born in the image of God, because He created mankind in the image of God, we all bear that image to a certain extent. But common love in all people has been marred and tainted by sin. The sin that moved in and pushed out the Spirit of God. Still, this common love dimly reflects the image of God. That means that common love allows any husband to love his wife. No excuses, men. And that means, wives, that common love allows any wife to love her husband. Because of common love, any parent can love a child, and any child can love a parent. Neighbor can love neighbor, and neighbors can even love enemies. This kind of love is common to all people, in all places, at all times. But in this passage, John does not describe common love. John is describing a love like no other. Consider this. Look in verses 7 through 9. This love is a born-again love. Listen to what John says. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been, look at that word, has been born of God. Like Jesus was born in Mary, not just born from Mary, but born in Mary. In some ways, the Spirit of God is born in us. Now, we can't push this illustration too far, or we'll find ourselves getting in trouble. But what John says to us is that God doesn't just give us His love, He gives us Himself. God does not just send His love to you and me, God sends Himself. That's what it means to be born again. The life of God is actually born in us. God's love is there because God is there. You and I can't generate this love. We can't mimic this love. And we can't fake this love. And when the life of God is born in you and me, we cannot stop this love. God's love is a love like no other. God loves through you and me because the life of God has been born in you and me. This love is like no other because it is a born-again love. But look at verse 10. In verse 7, John has looked back on the life of Jesus. But now in verse 10, John is looking back on the crucifixion of Jesus. John says to us in verse 10, Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the, underline that word, propitiation for our sins. Now, propitiation is a $10 word with a million dollar meaning that simply means punishment. Jesus took the punishment for our sins. Here's what John's saying. John is saying that in the crucifixion of Christ, the love of God runs into the sin of man. I've been asked many times throughout my ministry, if God can forgive, and He can, yes? Yes. If God can forgive, why didn't He just simply forgive? Why did Jesus have to die? Why couldn't God just step in and say to you and me, you're forgiven, and spare Jesus all the pain and suffering? Listen, here's the answer. Because God is love, yes, but God is also just. Think with me for a minute. Justice always demands that somebody pay. If you've ever been wronged, you know what I mean by this. There's not a person in this room that wants the federal government to turn a blind eye to nations who are aggressive against the United States and commit crimes. We want our country to marshal all of her forces against nations that commit crimes against our country. Look at 9-11. There's not a person in this room who would say to me this day that you want the government of North Carolina to turn a blind eye to crimes committed against her citizens. And there's not a person within the sound of my voice who would say that it's right for a parent to show favoritism for one child over another. The truth is, wrongs committed, no matter how large or how small, cry for justice. Listen, folks, God is love, yes, but God is 
just. So watch this. When Satan successfully tempted man to sin, he put God between a rock and a hard place, between his love and his justice. Remember? God had said to Adam and Eve, if you sin, you will what? You will die. That's what he said. If you sin, you will die. That's God's justice. That's the punishment for sin. God could not have been plainer, and he told us up front. You see, mankind's sin appeared to catch God between his love on the one hand and his justice on the other. God loves us, and he wants to forgive us, but his justice demands punishment. But if God forgives without punishment, he is no longer just. And if God punishes without forgiveness, He is no longer loving. Choosing one denies the other. God is denying one. He is no longer God. And Satan wins. Folks, you've got to understand something. When Satan tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, it was never about you and me. It was always about Satan. Satan knew that if he could get God caught between love and justice, the object of his love, what are you going to do? If he could get him to deny one characteristic over the other, God is no longer God and Satan has every right to take over and move in. It was never about you and me. Listen, here's John's point in verse 10. God's love for this world and God's justice toward sin met in the death of Jesus Christ. Out of love, Jesus took our punishment for us. And God gladly births His life and His love in any person who will turn from sin and place their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. God's love is no common love. God lo God's love loves with a power like no other. But there's also a purpose to God's love. You find the purpose of God's love in verses 11 through 12. What do we know about John? John was a man who was apprehended by the purpose of God's love. You'll see this a little better if you'll look back on John's journey. Jesus called John the beloved disciple. John knew that he knew that he knew that he was precious to Jesus. But it wasn't always this way. Early on, Jesus called John and his brother James the sons of thunder. You remember that? James and John must have always looked like two brothers that were waiting for a storm to happen. At one point, John's mother helps her sons jockey for the highest positions in Jesus' kingdom. You remember that story? Jesus, I got a great idea. Put James on the right, put John on the left. In other words, I think what she's saying is, look, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom and all of your power, I want you to make James the vice president and John the secretary of state. You know what James and John did at that point? Here's John just standing idly by, having no love, no regard whatsoever for what this was doing to the fellow disciples. Now, if that's how the sons of thunder treated their own friends, you can only imagine how they would treat their enemies. I'm pretty glad that they weren't made vice president and secretary of state in Jesus' kingdom. In fact, James and John leave little to our imagination. Do you remember the story when Jesus and his disciples are passing through Samaria and the Samaritans give Jesus a less than warm welcome? They kind of turn a cold shoulder, don't give him a place to stay. Do you, rem do you remember what the secretary of state and the vice president wanted to do at that point? Jesus, I think you ought to just rain down fire on the whole place, level it, make a parking lot out of it. As one of the sons of thunder, John battled for position among his brothers, and he prayed for the destruction of his enemies. But over time, the love of Jesus Christ made dramatic changes in this man's life. For all John got wrong, he got one thing right. He knew that he knew that he knew he was precious to Christ. So that meant that over time, the life and the love of Christ in John overcame his jealousy toward his brothers and his violence toward his enemies. Now think about this. Near the end of his life, 
near the end of his 90-year life, at the time that he's writing this letter. Right here in verses 7 and 11, look at them. John calls his brothers and sisters in Ephesus the very same thing Jesus had called him in Galilee. Precious, beloved, dearest friends. You know, that's one of the things I love about serving with Dr. Young. Do you know how many times he stands in this pulpit and you walk away feeling like you're precious to God? Do you know why? Because he knows he's precious to God. Not only that, John, the last living apostle at this point, refused to play it safe in the closing years of his life. In his aging days, at the time of writing this letter, John had thrown himself into the devil's backyard. At the time that John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, his new hometown of Ephesus had become the epicenter of the seismic clash between the Roman government, the Jewish religion, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. John's message in these two verses outlines the purpose of God's love. And here it is. God intends for us to shelter the love of Christ in ourselves, to show it in the church, and then share it in the world. But it begins with understanding that you are precious to God. As I've already pointed out, John calls the believers in Ephesus the same thing that Jesus had called him in Galilee. But if you go back to the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus was calling John the same thing the Father had called Jesus. You remember his baptism? Do you remember the voice that spoke from heaven and it said, This is my what? Beloved Son. In Him I am well pleased. So I don't think that it should surprise us that that's what Satan attacked first. Hear the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. Jesus is baptized and then called by the Spirit into the desert where he fasted and he prayed for 40 days. And at the end of that time, you remember what happened. In his physically weakened state, the devil comes and he tempts him. Do you remember what he said? If you are the son. You got it? In other words, Satan says to Jesus, prove it. I don't believe it. In fact, I don't think you believe it. If you're precious to God, prove it to me and prove it to yourself. Listen, beloved, you don't have to prove it to the devil. You don't have to prove it to yourself because God has proven it on the cross. You are precious to God. All you and I have to do is what Jesus did, proclaim it. When the enemy comes to you this week and he begins to make you doubt that you are precious to God, you simply point him to the cross. That's what Jesus did. Half of the trouble in your life disappears when you understand that you are precious to God. Half of the questions in your mind find their answers immediately when you understand that you are precious to God. The point is this, though, that you and I cannot give away what we do not ourselves possess. The evidence that the life of God is in us is that we understand first that we are precious to God. That's where the purpose of God's love starts. But friends, that is hardly where the purpose of God's love stops. Look at verse 11. John says to us, Dear friends, beloved, precious ones, if God loved us in this way, look at what he says, we must also love one another. You see, once the life and the love of Christ is born in you, It will spill over on everyone in the church. Why? Because that's the way God loves. If the life of God is born in us, then the love of God is going to flow through us. Look at what John says in verse 12. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us. No one has ever seen God. That's true. But John is indicating that if the world sees God's love in our love for one another, that's enough. In fact, 
it seems that that's one thing God really wants the world to see. John uses a very interesting word in verse 12. Verse 12 literally reads this way. Now listen closely. No one has ever, listen to this word, theatered God. No one has ever put God in the theater so all the world could come and see God. That is literally what John is saying. But John is indicating that if we love one another with the love of God in this church, the world can theater us. In other, world, in other words, the world can come to Woodlawn and see what the love of God looks like in living color. Do you see? God puts the local church on display just like a movie in a theater for all the world to see. Folks, listen to me. The world is not going to read our book until they, under, until they come to decide what they think about our movie. It is absolutely important how you and I treat one another in the church and in private and in public. John is telling you and me that the perfect love of God insists that this church will be the only picture that some people will see of Jesus. So in verses 11 and 12, John tells us that we can't share in the world what we don't show in the church, and we cannot show in the church what we do not shelter in ourselves. But when the life of God is born in us, and we know that we know that we know we are precious to God, we will show it in the church, and we will share it in the world. Then and only then is God's love called perfect. Now, I want to show you what that word means. Look at that word, perfect. Take another look at it. It is a very important word. This word was the very word that Jesus spoke, the last words on the cross. It is finished. The love of God in Christ's life at that point had completely run its course. Jesus had told us that if you obey the great commandment, to love God and love others, you will have obeyed all of the commandments. In Jesus' day, the Jewish teachers divided the Ten Commandments into two tables. Table one was made up of commandments one through four. Table two was made up of commandments six through ten. Table one had to do with the laws for loving God. Table two had to do with the laws for loving one another. But do you see one missing? Yes, commandment number five. But you see, the Jewish teachers understood commandment number five to be a bridge commandment that bridged table one to table two. Because in loving your mother and your father, or in honoring your mother and your father, you are loving God and you are loving others. Now watch this. For 33 years... Jesus has walked this earth and He has taught us and He has modeled perfect love toward God. And in the darkest hours of His sinless life, Jesus modeled perfect obedience to the law. While dying on the cross, He modeled perfect love toward God. Even to the point that when because of the sins that He took on, our sins that He took on the cross... He stayed faithful to God when his own father had to turn his back on his dying son. He also modeled perfect love for others. Whenever he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But there in that precious moment, you see Jesus modeling perfect love toward his mother. When he says to John, John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Love, God's love, this love like no other had fulfilled its purpose in Jesus' life. And the Bible says that he bowed his head in reverence to his father and he died. The love of God sheltered in Christ Jesus was shown to his followers and was shared with all the world. At that point, Jesus cries, it is finished, perfected. 
love of God had run its course. The love of God had perfected itself in Christ because in Christ, God's love had accomplished God's purpose. Listen, church. God apprehends you and me for the same purpose. Brothers and sisters, God has not set you free to live for yourselves. God has set us free to live for His purpose. And that love will reach in and out to all the world. Finally, we need to look at the assurance of God's love. Verses 13 through 21 introduce us to the assurance of God's love. We don't have time to cover them all this morning. But in this passage, John tells us about the power of God's love, the purpose of God's love. He also tells us about the assurance of God's love. The assurance of God's love, I think, will mean more to you today if you can understand a little more about what John had to fear. In fact, John had a lot to fear. In John's day, especially during this time, the Jews, his own people, had turned against Christianity. In the first century, in the year 85 AD, Jew Jewish leaders met together in what was called the Council of Jamnia. You might want to write that down, go to work, and impress your friends with it. For years, Christians had lived under this thin protection of Judaism because the Roman government thought they were a spinoff of the Jewish religion. But at the Council of Jamnia, the Jewish leaders decided they had had enough, and they banned all Christians from the synagogue. This decision exposed Christianity to the Roman government as an illegal religion. But to make matters worse, many Roman citizens considered Gentile Christians a clear and present danger to the safety and the security of the Roman Empire. You say, how in the world? They were a minority. You see, Romans believed that they had to keep the pagan gods happy in order to keep Rome safe and secure. So Roman citizens were obligated to worship the pagan gods in the festivals and in the ceremonies. <clears throat> but as the number of Gentile Christians rose, the number of pagan began to fall. Influential leaders in the Roman government began to blame the natural disasters and the political unrest on the growing Christian population who refused to worship in the pagan temples. Worst of all, at the time of the writing of this letter, the emperor Domitian had declared himself a god and demanded that all Roman citizens worship him, something that no professing Christian would ever dare to do. And right in the middle of all this turmoil, John, who was well into his 80s at this time and approaching his 90s, moves away from his home in Palestine to Ephesus in southwest Asia, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey today. This was the epicenter of all of this conflict. Pagan Gentiles despised John on the one side. His own Jewish people despised him on the other. And when he wasn't living under the fear of death, he was living under the reality of misunderstanding because most Roman citizens believed that Christians met weekly to eat one another's flesh and drink their blood in the Lord's Supper. John had a lot to fear. But John's message here that he proclaims to us is that God's love, a love like no other, literally sweeps this fear out the door. In verses 17 through 19, John tells us that the presence of this love in the life of the believer is living proof that the very life of God has been born in us. I think John is saying to the people here, and he's saying, the Spirit is saying to us today, examine yourself. Examine your actions. Do you see evidence for this love like no other? You and I can see it in Jesus. We can see it in John Jesus and John each knew that he knew that he knew he was precious to God. But this love like no other will not stay hidden in private. This love like no other is on a mission. Jesus and John displayed a love like no other for the brothers and the sisters in the church. And they also displayed a love like no other for those who live in this fallen world. Listen, the life of God growing in me generates the love of God flowing through me and sweeps every fear out of my life that's intimidating me. Do you have this perfect love that sweeps away the fear of loving yourself the way God loves you? 
Do you have this perfect love that sweeps away the fear of loving those beside you in the church right now? Do you possess this perfect love that reaches through you to a lost and a dying world? You say, not like John, and certainly not like Jesus. Apply this simple test this morning. And you'll quickly see if your heart is a heart of rebellion or a heart of willingness. Can you pray this morning, Holy Spirit, bring me to the point that I love myself the way you love me. It'll change your life. Can you pray this morning, Holy Spirit, bring me to the point that I love my brothers and sisters in this church the way you love them. What about that scoundrel at work? Can you pray this morning, Holy Spirit, bring me to the point that I love the people in this world the way you love them. Friends, we have a lot to fear today, too. For one thing, the church has been entrusted with a very public message for a society that believes that religion should remain a very private matter. Sharing the gospel at work tomorrow might be as awkward as if you were to walk in tomorrow at work and tell everybody in your workplace, okay, I've got a new rule. Here's what I want us to do. Today, after lunch, we're all lining up at the sink and we're all brushing our teeth. Awkward? Try telling them that they're all going to use the same toothbrush. You see, that's what religion feels like to people today. It's private. It's like my toothbrush. You don't bring that out in public and use it. Yeah, now you're getting it. I know. It took me a while too. And I've been working on this message for two weeks. (laughs) Most people don't want you talking about religion in public places, do they? But have you thought about this? Nobody in public minds you talking about your sweetheart. Nobody in public minds you talking about your engagement. Nobody in public minds hearing about your wedding ceremony. Nobody in public has any problem looking at the ultrasound pictures. Nobody in public whatsoever minds you hearing you brag on your children or brag on your grandchildren. Listen, when we present the good news of Jesus Christ as just another religion in the middle of a whole lot of religions, it's like walking into the bank with a loaded gun. Everybody dives for cover. But, When you demonstrate your love for God in the workplace, when you demonstrate His love for you, when you demonstrate your love for church, when you demonstrate God's love for the world, you move the conversation away from religion and you put it on relationship. And the love of God just sweeps all of that fear away. And just like in John's day, It's very easy today for Christians to be misunderstood. You know, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. I think that's one thing that holds me back from speaking out more. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. To be honest with you, I'm afraid of being misunderstood. It seems to me today that it's okay to discuss values in the public places as long as you agree with the values of the popular majority. But when the gospel offends public opinion, Christians today run the risk of being labeled prejudiced, intolerant, bigoted, and even the source of ideological hate crimes. But we must never forget as Christians that the gospel message concerns just about how good God is, not just about how good God is, but also what is wrong with this world. Brothers, sisters, if God has really spoken, and that's the issue, there's your issue. If God has really spoken, then we must take seriously His assessment of our condition. Listen, folks, we are not evolving. We are dying. That's his assessment. There's not a doctor in this room. There is not a doctor in this county. There is not a doctor in this state nor a doctor in this world who truly loves his patients that would withhold the cure 
and only show compassion. A loving doctor gives both, no matter how unpopular. Compassion without cure certainly means that no one dies alone. But all die. Compassion alone will not be enough for our condition. As unpopular as it might be today, the gospel offers compassion and the cure. Now one last thing. Look at what John says in verses 20 and 21. Folks, this is hard medicine, so listen carefully. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. Well, John could just cut to the chase, didn't he? You can do that when you're approaching death and you're 90 years old. Just cut to the chase. For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. Listen. If you have no evidence of the love of God in your life, John says that you should be concerned. Very concerned. Simply put, if the love of God is not flowing through you, listen, the life of God is not in you. You see, verses 17 through 21 cut like a surgeon's knife. These verses have to cut in order to heal. This love like no other gives us assurance that the God like no other has actually been born inside of us. Do you see evidence of this love? What about your family? Do they see evidence of this love? What about your friends? What about your enemies? If you have this love like no other in your heart, then you have the assurance of eternal life with God because God lives in you. But if you don't have this love like no other, you have every reason to fear your appointed and certain day of judgment. John warns us. If you have this love in your head, but you don't have this love in your heart, You know just enough about God to condemn you to hell. I don't know where you are on this journey. But I know your journey will look a little like the journey of Jesus, and it'll look a lot like the journey of John. Maybe you're brand new to this church thing here today. You feel a little out of place. And you're leaning in just close enough to see what it's all about and not get hurt. But the more you lean in, the more questions you have that are stirring up inside of you, and you know it's time to talk to somebody and get those answers. Maybe you're here today, and you've leaned in long enough, and you know it's time to fully surrender your allegiance to God. Today is the day for you to turn from sin and place your faith once and for all in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've already made this kind of decision, this personal decision in the privacy of your own heart. And it's time today to make that decision public. Maybe you're here today and you're a church member. And God is convicting your heart that He wants to heal those broken and strained relationships that you are dragging through this world. The living picture that you're showing our world is distorting the picture of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're a loving church member and God is convicting you today that you need to share the gospel of His love with the lost. Listen, wherever you are on this journey, come this morning and we'll pray together that God gives you this love like no other. Let's pray. Father in heaven, bring your Holy Spirit now and do the work that I cannot do. Move us along this journey no matter where we are. God, my prayer is that each one of us would just simply take one step today for Christ. Lord, whatever that step is is to be, we pray that your perfect love would wash away all the fear. In Jesus' name.
Amen.